Hello again, U.S. history students. Mr. Deegan here for another edition of VidNotes videos. Today, we're going to be continuing our study of Unit 1, Exploration and Colonization in America, and we're going to be studying Lesson 5, The Story of Slavery. So please get out your VidNotes packet. And today we're going to be exploring this guiding question. How did slavery start in America? This is a PBS documentary entitled Africans in America. And one thing to point out, when you start watching, you're going to have to turn up your volumes because the documentary isn't very loud at first. So please turn up those volumes, get those pens or pencils ready for notes, and enjoy this excerpt from the documentary Africans in America. They came from different lands, all facing an uncertain future. English and Ashanti, Mendy and Portuguese, German and Igbo, Fanti and Spaniard, French and Angolan, some seeking adventure or riches or religious freedom. Others were captives, bartered and sold like cattle. Together they would build a nation and struggle over the very meaning of freedom and create the America we have inherited today. I don't think you can understand race relations today without understanding slavery. Even though people will say, I didn't do it, my father didn't do it, even my grandparents, they didn't do it. One of the things that's essential is to know that slavery is not just a Southern institution, it's an American institution. What evolves in North America is the belief system where to be black meant to be a slave and to be a slave meant to be black. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Why is it self-evident? It came from God. They're inalienable. Government secures them. Remarkable document. Didn't apply to black folks. And the man who wrote them for those words Thomas Jefferson kept slaves. He also wrote sometime later to a friend, if there is a just God, we're going to pay for this. Slavery and freedom existed side by side in this country. I think the issue is, did it always have to be that way? And the early history of America indicates that it probably did not. Englishmen believed that their God had ordained them to spread his word and that they had the God-given right to drive out all unwilling to live according to English law. But in the first two years, the colonists learned that they were unprepared for life in the American wilderness. In 1609, 500 settlers lived in the Jamestown colony. By the spring of 1610, only 60 were left alive. In 1619, a year before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, a mystery ship appeared out of a violent storm off the Virginia coast. No one recorded the ship's name, but somewhere on the high seas, 
she had robbed a Spanish vessel of a cargo of Africans. In search of supplies, she traded the Africans for food. They had been baptized and given Christian names. As Christians, they could not be enslaved for life under English law. Like most Europeans in the colony, they were purchased to work as servants for a limited number of years. The new arrival supplied much needed labor for the tobacco crop that was making men rich. Settlers were planting tobacco in the streets of Jamestown, carving plantations out of the surrounding wilderness and shipping some 60,000 pounds a year back to England. Once tobacco is established as a viable commodity, then the more land you control, the bigger profits you can make. And in order to make those profits, you need more labor, and you look for that labor wherever you can find it. Well, the colony builders uh, initially intended to rely almost exclusively on white indentured servants as a labor force to cultivate the crops that were being grown in Virginia, principally tobacco. And in order to create these raw materials of goods, you often needed labor. Here's a how to the company and one to my life. The world the Africans entered was controlled by wealthy Englishmen and populated by the English poor, most under the age of 25. In return for passage to Virginia, they had traded four to seven years of their labor. They were bound to a master by an indenture form, a contract that defined length of service and the conditions of servitude. Most were promised freedom dues after their service, a bushel of corn, a new suit of clothes, and 100 acres of land. Under Virginia's head right system, a planter was entitled to 50 acres of land for each servant brought into the colony. The issue always was how long that indenture would be and, and under what conditions you would be forced to work. At its best, it was a short friendly apprenticeship, you know, at its worst, it was, a, it was a long and exploitative situation in which you might die before you ever obtained your freedom. By 1622, 3,000 new settlers drawn by the opportunities of the tobacco boom had arrived in Virginia. Two years later, the first Negro child was born in the colony. He was named William Tucker after a Virginia planter. The prosperity that began in 1619 and the dream of a new Eden, of people peacefully coexisting under English law, was seriously threatened in March 1622. On Good Friday, some 30 nations of the Powhatan Confederacy, angered by English violation of land treaties, attacked without warning and attempted to drive the English back into the sea. Along the James River, the Indians killed 350 colonists. On the Bennett Plantation alone, 52 people died. Among the 12 who survived was a man named Antonio. Here's an individual that arrives as one of the first African Americans in the history of what became the United States. He does what almost no one in early Virginia managed to do, and that is live. Everyone that's dying of disease, of violence, and since he's lucky, he had been brought to the colony the year before to work tobacco along the James River. His name appeared in the 1625 Virginia census as Antonio a Negro. He was listed as a servant. 
He comes to Virginia, finds a society that is just developing. He's getting in on the ground floor, as it, as it were. Um, I don't know if he was able to immediately envision that there would be opportunities for him here that uh, weren't available elsewhere. I don't know that anyone could have foretold that. When Antonio arrived, the laws of Virginia did not as yet define racial slavery. They governed only the status of servants. At some point, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson and married a Negro servant named Mary from a neighboring plantation. She bore him four children. By 1640, it is clear Anthony and Mary were no longer servants. They had acquired their own modest estate on Virginia's eastern shore. As Johnson prospered, as he obtained land and cattle, he also acquired dependent laborers. What made all of this society go was property. Your identity in the society was determined rather obviously by the amount of land, the amount of labor that you owned. Anthony Johnson was enjoying privileges belonging to a free Englishman. He claimed five workers as head rights and expanded his property to 250 acres along the Pongateague Creek. At least some of his workers were white. By 1650, Anthony was one of 400 black people in Virginia out of a population of almost 19,000 settlers. In Northampton County, where Johnson lived, nearly 20 African men and women were free, and 13 owned their own homes. As Anthony Johnson is accumulating property, it seems as though his situation is secure. You get a sense of this individual, this black man, being treated like any white planter, and his wife and daughters being treated like the wife of a planter. At an early moment, when men and women were sorting themselves out, when the rules, the etiquette of race, labor, were not so clear, at this moment, in one county in Virginia, it was not foreordained that race relations would become what they did become. In 1640, the year Anthony Johnson purchased his first piece of land, three servants had run away from a Virginia plantation and headed for Maryland. Captured and returned to their owner, they were tried for breaking their contract. The said three servants shall receive the punishment of whipping and to have 30 stripes apiece. One called Victor, a Dutchman, the other a Scotchman called James Gregory, shall first serve out their times according to their indentures and one whole year apiece after. And after that to serve the colony for three whole years apiece. The third, being a Negro named John Punch, shall serve his said master or his assigns for the time of his natural life. Jamestown Court Recorder. The time of his natural life. According to all the legal records that survive, no white servant in America ever received such a sentence. So what begins to happen in the 1640s is that those who are controlling the Virginia colony say to themselves, the fluidity that we've seen in the past, the fluidity that has allowed an Anthony Johnson to serve less than a life term, to acquire his own piece of ground, to develop a free status, is not something that we want to project as going further in the future. We want to close down that opportunity. We want to begin to show some distinctions. The English definition of who could be enslaved began to shift from non-Christian to non-white. For Anthony and other Africans in America, the idea of an equal chance in the colonies was now under attack. In 1641, Massachusetts became the first colony on the British American mainland to recognize slavery as a legal institution. 
Connecticut followed in 1650, Maryland in 1663, New York and New Jersey in 1664. Virginia legally recognized slavery in 1661, and a year later, a Virginia court decided that all children born in the colony would be free or slave according to the condition of the mother. In Virginia, slavery would be defined by race and perpetuated through heredity. Perhaps in the middle of the 17th century, if you were one of several thousand Africans living in Virginia, uh, you certainly knew that your children would, would uh, be free. You might have that expectation. And to suddenly find themselves involved in lifelong servitude and then to realize that in fact their children might inherit the same status, that was a terrible blow. That was a terrible transformation. You are almost finished with lesson five, the last lesson of unit one, but you have your summary questions remaining. Please fill out those summary questions now. When you're done with those summary questions, you are finished for today. Until next time, this is Mr. Deegan signing off.